Okay, great. Thanks everybody for being here. Michael, just double checking again that you can hear me. Yeah. Everything's good now? Yeah, great. So, well, first of all, uh, apologies for the technical problems. Uh, open source software, you know, it's a type of commons and it's, uh, it's a bit messy at times. Um, but regardless of that, I would like maybe to start us off uh, today by being uh, wishing you all a happy May Day, happy May 1st, uh, and to remember uh, the struggles of the past of the people who struggle to, you know, give us the rights that, that we have today, uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, and all the people that make life possible. So that would be a good intention to sort of start us off today. Um, yeah, and based on that, I want to give a round of introductions. So maybe Guy, uh, Michael, and David could introduce yourself and your work, and then. Uh, we'll take it for questions that we sent you previously. Ah, okay. So we start. <clears throat> so we start. Mm -hmm. oh, you got right. the mic. You're the editor. No. Like, David, you stop. Um, so we start with Guy, I was going to say. No. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Guy Standing, and I'm an economist, and I've been working on the precariat and rentier capitalism for many years. And I've got a book called The Corruption of Capitalism, on which I'll be drawing in our discussion this afternoon. Mm, superb. And Michael? Uh, my main, uh, I focus on how uh, industrial capitalism has evolved into finance capitalism, which has really elapsed back into neo-feudalism, uh, and it's created a rentier society, uh, a rentier capitalism. I just I outline uh, my theory in the history of this evolution and killing the host on how finance is uh, strangling the economy. Mm. Uh, and I am David Graeber. I guess in this context, I'm largely known for, for my work on debt, debt the first 5,000 years, which was in part inspired by the works of Michael Hudson, who um, really kicked me off into it, was uh, reading his analysis of both Mesopotamian debt jubilees and of the structure of the American empire, debt imperialism, uh, ideas I've been thinking with ever since. Uh, more recently, uh, writing about uh, bullshit jobs, where I kind of threw out the phrase managerial feudalism as a way of describing the kind of system we seem to be involved, evolving into. And I think this is a, a, a wonderful opportunity, this conversation, because one of the things that I've been struggling with uh, ever since that has been, you know, should this system be characterized as capitalism at all? Is it a type of capitalism? Is it a reversion to an older form of uh, pre-capitalist form of feudalism? Or was capitalism always that? And that it was just like had an industrial side, which um, was never its primary characteristic. Um, you know, I often say that future historians may well have decided decide that capitalism, you know, ended in 1975, and we're in a completely different phase now. We just have no idea what they're going to call it. So you know, that kind of conceptual work um, is really, really important for us to be doing at this moment where essentially, you know, the world has set the reset button, and we have to think very hard about what we've actually got that we're resetting. Yeah, about that, David, um, maybe also it would be nice for uh, each of you to tell us what is your analysis of the Corona crisis so far? Um, will you talk about a reset button? What do you what do you mean by that? Well, I guess we're, that, was, that was may as well start. Um, I mean, it strikes me that sometimes I think, you know, if I were a benevolent deity and I wanted to send a wake-up call to humanity, you know, um, I can't think of a better way to do it. You know, you don't want to want to do something that, like, hurts enough that people actually can't ignore it, but it doesn't still hurt me and too many people. Um, I, uh, um, you know, this is this is a moment of, of, of terrible suffering and tragedy, but it's also a moment of extraordinary opportunity in the sense that, you know, most of us have been trying to shake the system and say, come on guys, we're heading towards the wall here. You know, this is gonna be a total disaster um, in five, 10 years down the line in terms of uh, the, the um, financial system in particular. Okay, uh, maybe a, a, a 
easy way to sum up my position is that I think what, what, what the coronavirus situation has revealed even more than 2008 is that the basic line that they've been giving us, what the financial system is supposed to be for, is clearly not true. Now, the argument was, you know, the only alternative to capitalism is some sort of system of socialist, state socialist, central planning, five-year plans. You know, those don't really work. Instead, the market, by which they global financial markets, is going to, like, be prescient enough to figure out what future needs are in a way that no human being could be wise enough to do. Uh, it can direct investment to, to 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 maximize you know the future happiness, flourishing, and prosperity of human beings in general. Um, well, you know, no way they can say that now. It's clearly failed in the most cosmic way conceivable. You know, um, we're all sitting here like locked up in our houses uh, and um, looking forward to. Our, our cities being underwater in five or ten years. Um, so, you know, it doesn't do that. Uh, what does it do, and what kind of system could replace it uh, in a way that actually doesn't do those things? Uh, can I say, David uses the word opportunity, and the question is, opportunity for for whom? On the one hand, of course, it's an opportunity to in, uh, introduce Medicare for all, a single payer uh, medicine in the United States, because the government obviously has uh, uh, does, wants to save society by providing medical care for everybody so they don't infect uh, the whole society. But so far, it's only the financial sector that's grabbed the opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's the rentier sector uh, that Guy's talking about. And they've used the, it as an opportunity to push uh, $8 trillion into the stock and bond market to say, give us your junk bonds, uh, give us your bad stocks. We're taking all the bad debts on our books. And it's been a huge bailout for uh, the sector that's fighting all of the opportunities that uh, David's talking about. Uh, there, you, uh, there's an opportunity to grab the public domain from state and local governments that are going broke here. This, in America, the state and local governments pay the unemployment insurance and uh, uh, and the medical care and uh, uh, have lower taxes as a result of the slowdown in activity. So they're going broke. Uh, third world countries are going broke because there's a, a decline in uh, raw materials trade uh, and they're uh, defaulting on the debt. And the IMF says this is a great opportunity for a stabilization program. You stabilize by selling all of your what remains in your infrastructure, your uh, mineral rights, your land, sell them all to the foreign bondholders to pay your foreign debts. Uh, and the farmers, uh, here's an opportunity uh, with the farmers going bankrupt for the, the large uh, grain monopolies and uh, meat monopolies to buy up all the small farms that remain. So the question is opportunity for whom and who's going to use it? Mm. May I come in? Please. Sure. Yes, okay. mm -hmm. um, I, I think this has to be seen as the transformation crisis of uh, global transformation. So it could go up way. But I think it's important to put it in the context of the growth of rentier capitalism. If you go back to the 1970s and 1980s, when the Montpellier Society and neoliberalism arose, they morphed into the growth of finance. And financial capitalism basically captured the states and ushered in a period where they constructed an international architecture of rentier capitalism. Mm -hmm. So that more and more total income was flowing to the owners of property, physical property, financial property, intellectual property, and so on. And as I've argued in a new book, which coincidentally came out in March, called Battling Eight Giants, my thesis was in the book that global rentier capitalism would create what I've called eight giants. And the eight giants are inequality, insecurity, huge debt, stress, precarity, uh, automation, the threat of extinction, and populism. These eight giants. And what the eight giants have done is make the international economic system incredibly fragile. So that when, it, when the pandemic hit, it was effectively a trigger. That's my being, I, I was merely saying, this is going to be a crisis waiting to happen. The pandemic, is the crisis, the trigger point, the equivalent of the shooting of the Archduke in August 
1914. That wasn't the cause of the war, but it was the trigger. And the interesting thing is to compare the crisis now with the crisis at the time of the Spanish flu, mm. years ago, when 50 million people died from that Spanish flu. And the interesting thing is that it wasn't actually uh, a wake-up call for a global slump. There wasn't a global slump in, in 1920. But we are going to have a global slump. And the reasons are that those giants have become so huge, and in particular debt. At the time of the Spanish flu, U.S. debt, private debt, was about 50% of GDP. Corporate debt hardly existed. Uh, financialization wasn't that great. And the U.S. economy had enough uh, dynamism in it to be able to pull the global economy back to some sort of growth path. This time, before the pandemic struck, U.S. private debt was 150% of GDP. That's higher than it was at the very height of the Great Depression in the 1930s. And corporate debt was 33% of GDP. And financialization had shifted from being 100% of GDP in the 1970s in the United States to 350% of GDP. So the financial bubbles, which we've been analyzing and seeing for the last 25 years or so, become hugely speculative and likely to be pricked and, and explode. So we've got a situation now where we've got supply shocks, demand shocks, and we're going to have a huge fall in income. And this provides a moment where we could see, as Karl Polanyi famously said, a threat of the annihilation of civilization. We can see a global transformation with a new progressive agenda. And I think we're on the, the cusp of going either way. And we can come back to some of the subjects. But the essence of it is to see red capitalism as the villain of the piece, mm. and then say that unless we dismantle rentier capitalism, we're not going to have a progressive agenda. Well, Guy uses the word progressive, and I think that's uh, the key. Uh, what we're seeing in the rentier capitalism is a regression. In other words, the whole uh, the hundred years of classical political economy, from Adam Smith through Ricardo and John Stuart Mill, a hundred years they were saying, let's get rid of the rentiers. This is, these are the residues of feudalism. They're the residues of the past, uh, honor, uh, the absentee landlord class, the bankers and the monopolists, uh, and they developed, uh, they were, uh, the idea that uh, industrial capitalism had a destiny, and that was to free markets and free society from the rentiers. And then after, after World War I, the rentiers fought back. Uh, and they replaced classical economics with an anti-classical economics where uh, they redefined a, a free market as a market free for the rentiers to, to privatize the public domain, to grab uh, society and to essentially uh, take uh, finance into the private sector and make it a tool of uh, ra raiding very much like a military tool of taking over uh, industry, taking over over governments, as, as Guy said. So the, uh, I think we need to re redrawing the contrast between what used to be called the progressive uh, agenda and either the neo-feudal or the regressive agenda is, uh, I think, our common denominator. Hmm. Well, it's interesting historically because, of course, if you look, one of the puzzling things about the history of capitalism is, you know, you have the first 250 years. If you assume capitalism around for 500 years, the first 250 wage labor industry was not the dominant um, driving force. Um, it was largely colonial corporations were largely colonial enterprises based on various forms of slave labor, forced labor, debt labor. But all the financial instruments, which are characteristic of capitalism, you know, put options and uh, all sorts of speculative forms of paper. I mean, all that stuff was actually developed before the Industrial Revolution. So in a way, finance capitalism comes first. Now, so I guess the argument is you could say that actually this, these, these 
complex securitized derivatives are really themselves a complex form of feudalism. Uh, maybe so, because actually some of the first um, forms of, of, of financial options were actually people could buy shares in military expeditions, like in Venice, you know, when they went off raiding the North African coast, you could like invest in, in the loot. Um, and then people would start trading around the papers with the promises of what you get from very, you know, so so a very peculiar form of feudalism and and, and of, of markets they had in Europe, whereby war and uh, speculation and um, the market were all entirely intertwined, which in the Islamic world they were kept totally separate. Um, so so then the question becomes, you know, was there ever that pure capitalism, or was it a kind of a a crazy liberal project that happened the, uh, with the Industrial Revolution, where people imagined that that could happen, and that's where it was tending. I'd like to come uh, come back, uh, mm -hmm. David. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether the use of the term feudalism mm -hmm. is appropriate in the 21st century in the sense that one of our challenges uh, from a political economy point of view mm -hmm. is to find a new vocabulary and set of images appropriate for this phase of global capitalism. And I'm, I'm sitting outside Geneva and when I first came to work in the United Nations, it was very interesting that the UN system, UNCTAD and uh, UNDP and so on were the dominant institutions. Then the World Bank became an mm -hmm. institute of neoliberalism and then it morphed into helping in the construction of rentier capitalism. But very interestingly, when, when I first came here, there was a tiny organization down the road with, with a funny name person in charge and it had a funny name that sounded like a detergent. And we all used to laugh at it when we would go for drinks in the evening and say, what the hell is WIPO? What's it doing? Anyhow, if you came to Geneva today, WIPO is the biggest international organization in Geneva. And as you know, Geneva is dominated by all the international organizations. And WIPO was the, the child of the World Trade Organization and the, the Doha Round and, and so on. And the fundamental uh, development of rentier capitalism can be actually timed to 1994. That's when it sort of really came out of its birth phase with the, pass the passage of trips. And trade-related aspects of intellectual property has globalized the US uh, intellectual property rights regime. And the WIPO is now huge, and every year millions of patents are filed, millions of copyrights, millions of industrial designs, brands, and so on. And it's become an engine for sucking out rent. Mm. The interesting thing is in 1994, US financial capital and big pharma and big tech were the instruments behind the establishment of TRIPS. And they thought it would be the establishment and enthronement of U.S. capitalism. And for a while, it was, because China was not a member of the World Trade Organization and didn't join until 2001, mm -hmm. looking at the latest figures. Now China is filing more patents than the United States, Japan, South Korea, and the European Union combined. And the interesting thing, as in every transformation, the geopolitical developments alongside the technological developments and the phasing of, of capitalist development is meaning a new center, an epicenter of global capitalism is, is China and perhaps India, because India is coming up as well. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting thing, because you can interpret these tensions between Trumpism and the Chinese, and the, the tendencies like remind us of the 1930s, because the United States is the declining rentier state, and China is the rising one, just as in the 1920s and 1930s, the US was the power, whereas the European, the European countries 
were the declining ones. So I think that, that you can interpret this phase of capitalism as a transformational moment. But the trouble is that the rentiers between them from taking from finance, from patents, from subsidies, from debt, which we haven't talked about yet, and from plundering the commons, they know they've taken too much for the system to be sustainable or stable enough for it to survive. And this is why this pandemic crisis is potentially a transformational one, or we'll have a shift to neo-fascist populism. And that must be a, a big fear that we've got. And we're seeing it in Europe as well as the United States. So it's not just Trumpism. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. Um, just wanted to bring the conversation a bit into uh, maybe defining a bit more what is what 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 do you mean when you say rentier capitalism what is what is what is rentier capitalism in your work um you know the three of you have have you know there is an emphasis on the emergence of new social classes such as the precariat uh, managerial feudalism with bullshit jobs and financial parasites killing the host or the real economy um can you maybe explain what those are for the lay audiences um well Well, the name implies uh, rentier capitalism is uh, where most of society's income are paid to the rent seekers. It, precisely the classes that uh, classical economics, Adam Smith on, were supposed to save economy from. And it means that uh, they've uh, the rentiers have taken over the government. You can look at, uh, the question is, who is going to control the government? And the whole 19th century was a fight, the fight for uh, de democratic reform was against the House of Lords. Uh, that was representing the uh, real estate, the landlord interests. And they thought if we can get, uh, if we can shift power from the House of Lords into the House of Commons, then the people will act on, uh, they will get rid of the land rent and we'll either tax it away or we'll take land into the public domain uh, along with uh, mineral rights and uh, uh, the intellectual property rights. The property rights Uh, uh, that a uh, guy talks about really should be, uh, they're, they're public in, in character, like pharmaceuticals, like medi medical uh, uh, discovery. Technology should be something that's universal. And if it can be privatized, then you can sit there and just uh, make people pay for the right to use it. it treating, treating technology as if you're a landlord charging rent for the land. And that's uh, uh, basically what, uh, what we're seeing today. Uh, this kind of rentier uh, uh, capitalism that uh, uh, is the reversal of uh, essentially it's privatization and uh, it lives uh, it lives in the short run. Uh, I think that all of the Wall Street people I know are quite aware of the fact that it, it's unsustainable. They know that. Uh, all the CEOs I talk to know it and they say we're going to grab what we can while we can and then there'll be uh, when it collapses it's a new grab bag. So they're preparing themselves to uh, position themselves to have as much liquid cash as possible, uh, government securities uh, that can be monetized, uh, to uh, come for the next next grab bag. So the question is, will the next grab bag be financial or will it be uh, political by groups acting, uh, the Rontier's victims acting on their own to uh, re-take uh, uh, back into the public domain what was supposed to be put there in the 19th century? Mm. I have a question uh, to you, Michael, um, and I was somewhat inspired by, by Guy uh, when uh, you talk about China versus America and sort of battle of the Rontiers. Well, of course, you know, it, this is seen as a battle of old and possibly rising new hegemon, but traditionally um, the economic hegemon it, well, is also the military hegemon. I mean, to some degree, You know, the U.S. replaced the U.K. as the primary global military power at the same time as the dollar re replaced the sterling. And before that, there was a Dutch and uh, the Italian bankers of the Spanish. So, 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 you know, at, you've written extensively on the relation of the U.S. dollar hegemony, treasury bond imperialism, and U.S. military power. How it used to fund the Pentagon and the Pentagon reinforces uh, this regime. So it's not so so. What do you think is the relationship of rentier capitalism and sheer brute power? Uh, and to what degree is that what's at actual stake here? 
Uh, it, it solidifies itself by brute power. If you look through uh, Roman history, uh, century after century, every populist leader was assassinated. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, from the, the Gracchi down to Julius Caesar. Uh, and again and again, uh, they, uh, they were very clear, uh, the Roman Senate. They said, you can't have an oligarchy unless you're willing to kill everybody who wants to aspire to kingship. Kingship means a strong public sector. Uh, and the Greeks would call them tyrants. The tyrants were the reformers that got rid of the rentier class, that got rid of the uh, sort of mafiosi states of the seventh se uh, century. And as I, I've uh, mentioned before, the Chicago School said, look, we can't have a free market uh, unless we go down to Chile and we kill all of the uh, labor leaders, the land uh, uh, redistributors, uh, and uh, uh, close down every economics department that doesn't teach uh, the free market. So yes, uh, military, uh, you, you, you can use uh, the CIA assassination themes as making sure that no one, uh, no individual rises to a position of influence who can give a narrative that is different from the narrative saying uh, uh, the one percent uh, are leading society into the future and uh, the wealth will trickle down. So the rentiers promote a trickle down society where uh, actually it's simply a uh, rentier, a sucking up uh, uh, of uh, income uh, to itself, an extractive society pretending to be a productive society. I'd like to come here, come in here, please, because yeah. Uh, um, I, I think we've got to go back to Julio's uh, point about the, um, the class structure. Mm. I don't think you can analyze any form of capitalism without looking at the class dynamics and the class struggle that is implicit in that. And what I've argued in the books that I've written on this subject, uh, starting with the precariat, is that we've essentially seen a global class structure being superimposed on old class structures. We have a plutocracy at the top. It's not 1%, it's a much less than that. Um, and underneath that, elites, then a proficient class, which is uh, making a lot of money, etc. but they're independently. Then you have a salariat, then underneath that, the old proletariat, then the precariat, and then a lumpen, okay? And if you look at it, the top four, categories are all earning a hell of a lot of money through forms of rent. You cannot say the salariat is the old working class because they're getting 50% of their total income from various forms of rent. The elite gets more than that. The plutocracy gets most of their income from rent. Whereas the precariat is exploited not just through wage labor, but through various forms of rent, in particular through debt mechanisms, but also other forms, loss of the commons and so on. And I think one of the problems for the class struggle that's implicit in the global class structure, mm -hmm. the plutocracy have an alliance with the atavistic part of the old proletariat, and mm -hmm. part of the precariat who are being fed a populist agenda that the enemy is the other, the Chinese, the migrants, the Muslims, whatever. And that populist threat is, is growing. But the only class in this global class structure that is genuinely progressive and potentially transformative is the precariat, because mm -hmm. the precariat is the one that is most exploited by rent mechanisms. So it wants to see the, the transformation, the dismantling of a rentier system. And when I talk to student groups who see themselves as part of the precariat, they, they, they understand if I go through the intellectual property rights and say, is it this situation that big pharma can take out a patent for 40 years, giving them rental incomes through monopoly pricing that they haven't done anything to deserve or, or invest because the public did most of the investing in developing those patents, then very quickly people see it. The same with securitization through the financial markets and, and, and through the debt mechanisms. So I think that we have to forge a, a, an agenda, an analysis, 
which looks forward and says, okay, where's the weak point in the development of rentier capitalism where people can understand that the inequities of the rentier processes uh, justify a countervailing strategy and a political action, a sense of revolt. And unless we analyze the processes of rentier capitalism, we'll fall short of that. And I think, I think the challenge for political economists is this new conceptualization. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, I definitely remember that back when very early days of Occupy, uh, Marissa Holmes was one of the key organizers, was also a videographer. And she went around. When all these people showed up, we had no idea who they were. Um, we had no idea whether anybody was going to show up for the occupation. Went around and interviewed people and discovered that pretty much everyone had the same story, which was essentially, you know, we were the good kids. We, we got to college, we got to good colleges, we took out loans, we thought we have to do, you know, we studied hard, we got good grades. Then these assholes crashed the economy, uh, there's no jobs, they get bailed out by the government, we're being told that we're a bunch of losers and deadbeats for the rest of our lives with we owe money to those guys uh, who just got bailed out. You know, that's ridiculous. Um, and um, so, so I think there is a keen awareness and the people are really getting it on the chin. And that's why you have in both Britain and, and the US this unprecedented situation where you know, majorities of young people reject the capitalist system entirely, which wasn't even really true, I think, statistically in the 30s and the 60s. Um, so, so and, that, and, and I think part of this, too, if we're thinking about the precarious work, another thing that really struck me in the early days of Occupy was people were saying, look at these people in this square, they're not representative of anybody, like half of them have green hair, you know, they're not real proletarian. And, you know, my first reaction that was like, yeah, look at the people who are delivering your packages, you know, <laughs> look at the people who are actually working. Um, half of them are trapped in this situation where they're kind of like permanent post-students or still are students. Another interesting thing is how the education system is entangled in the world of work. Yeah, um, so that larger and larger numbers of people are actually, you know, getting some college education in countries like America, but less and less people are actually graduating. Um, so you have this class of people who are just sort of permanently sort of students, sort of workers, and it's never going to end. You know, the sort of point at which um, it's a little bit like some anthropological analysis of, of what happened um, in parts of the world, like of the colonial world, actually, after slaves were freed but not given land. You know, you end up in a situation where you have an ideal of a nuclear household family, but no one's actually able to achieve it. Um, they're stuck as permanent adolescents. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do you mobilize them as a political force? And how does that relate to the larger um, you know, what are the primary forces behind the political movements that we do see? And I'd be very interested in hearing um, your, both, both Guy and Michael, what, what your feeling is about this. My feeling is that, you know, it seems we have two political forces that are accepted as legitimate by the kind of pro political and media classes. There's this neoliberal center, uh, which has left and right wing variants, you know, Merkel would be the right wing variants, and, I don't know, Trudeau would be the left wing uh, variant, but but they're both the same thing, basically. Um, now we've got, like, the, they've taken over the Labour Party here in the UK. Um, and that basically represents finance capital, but their social base seems to be the professional managerial classes. You know, all these formerly left wing parties having basically booted out the unions and the, uh, the, the traditional working class and got the professional managerials as their core. Uh, and then you have a right populist right and, and, you know, they're based to some, to some degree in the extractive industries, but I think the construction industry is really critical here. And the role is, is, is much under, uh, uh, because, you know, if, look at the UK, you know, it's finance and construction is driving the economy. And of course they're linked, uh, but construction is a very inter interesting industry. Traditionally, they're the people who, um, you know, construction real estate had actually used to be the only section of capital that was willing to support social democratic policies. You know, they wanted people to be able to like buy houses. They couldn't export their product. Um, and nowadays, you know, then they kind of teamed up with real estate. You could say in the 
years leading up to the 2008 crash, there was this kind of devil's bargain between the finance, the finance and the real estate sector, which gave us the subprime mortgages. That, the divorce was uh, Trump versus Clinton. Clinton basically running as the candidate of, of finance of Goldman Sachs. Trump is this kind of classic corporatist, um, uh, basically 1930s fascist style corporatist arguing that employers and employees and in industry have common interests against finance. Um, but doing the, the right wing variation on that, but the only to the fact that that finance and the Pentagon are so deeply entangled, the fascist guy is running as the peace candidate. But I think it's not a coincidence that um, that that he was a construction guy. If you look around the world, what's really driving carbon emissions is infrastructure. And there's this insane batch of infrastructure creation going on everywhere. They're building like uh, airports and ports and roads and all this stuff that nobody ever uses. And especially putting up apartment and office blocks all over the world. Um, you know, Putin comes out of a party. Uh, founded by a guy, Mayor Lushkov, uh, who was famous for this. He would just like throw up these blocks of office buildings. And then they try to figure out some, somebody to put them in. So of course, then they have to create the bullshit jobs to support the sort of bad construction. They feed off each other. Um, and I think that, that Ahmadi Nejad in, in, in Persia, you know, classic, some people called him the Rush Limbo of, of Iran. Uh, he was this guy, he's entirely based on like creating cities out of nothing. And they were terrible, they fell apart. I mean, some one of them like, entirely fell down in an earthquake. Um, but so, so this kind of mad construction Modi in India is based on seems to be the social base of right-wing populism. The question is, what is the sort of class base of an effective left-wing opposition? May I come and, in here? May yeah. I come in here? I, I, when I wrote the, uh, my first book on the precariat in 2011, mm -hmm. one, I said, unless there's a progressive agenda for the precariat, uh, includes a basic income, we're going to see the emergence of a political monster. And we have. <laughs> In 2016, I got a lot of emails from all over the world, by which time the book had been translated into 20 languages, and I got a deluge of emails saying, your monster has arrived. <laughs> and what I've done in, in the books is say, look, the precariat is the emerging mass class. Okay, the, an emerging mass class with distinctive relations of production, relations of distribution, and relations to the state. Many people who commented on the book and the concept have focused on unstable jobs, bullshit jobs part of it. For me, that's the least important aspect of the precariat. The precariat is defined in terms of, first of all, having to do a hell of a lot of work that is not labor. Work for labor, work for the state. It hasn't got a sense of occupational identity or narrative. It's doing bits and pieces, and it's living on the edge of unsustainable debt because it is exploited through rentier mechanisms, primarily debt, but other forms of rentierism, and it's been losing the commons, where the commons used to provide the the workers with a social, an informal social structure of support. And in particular, the precariat have been losing the rights of citizenship. They've been losing the sense of being a full citizen, losing social rights, economic rights, cultural rights, and so on. But the important thing is it's a class in the making. This was back in 2011, 2012, a class in the making, not yet a class for itself in the Marxian mm -hmm. term. And the class in the making is always internally divided. So you had three factions. The first faction I called the atavists. These are the people who don't have a lot of education. And as I put it, they have a, a lost past. They feel a relative deprivation through having lost the past. This group will vote for the populists who promised to bring back yesterday. You know, make, make America great again. Boris Johnson says, get out of uh, the EU and I'll bring you back yesterday. And noticeably, that group, that part of the precariat has voted for the far right and for the neo the neo-fascist populists. And if you look at the British general election last December, 
A majority of the old manual workers and low educated voted conservative. Whereas a majority of those who voted who had higher education, particularly the educated part of the precariat, voted for Labour or for Greens, mainly for Labour. And the interesting thing is that the second part of the precariat I've called the nostalgics. These are people who've lost a sense of present. They're the migrants, the minorities, they have no sense of home, and they don't participate in politics at all because they don't have full citizenship, etc. But the interesting vanguard part of the precariat I call progressives. And these are the ones that you, David, and, and, and Michael and others have been addressing in a sense, are those who go to university, go to college, and they're promised by their teachers and their parents that mm. they have a future. Do that and you'll have a career. You will have a future. You will have status. But they come out, of course, with frustrations, debts, and no future. And this part is looking for a politics of paradise, and the left has not provided it. That's the key point. And that's why most of the precariat, educated precariat, have not been voting at all. The biggest block in the British British election last year were those who didn't vote. They were the biggest party. And we've got a situation where we have to have an agenda that appeals to that progressive part. And that is why when I talk about basic income everywhere, they're, they're saying, come on, it's a no-brainer. Of course we need a basic income. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you go, you get that sort of reaction. And I think that is where the Labour parties are missing the trick now because they're not offering that. They're running away from that because they want to go back to the old Labourism of linking everything to trade unions, to jobs, more jobs, mm -hmm. all of that old agenda which doesn't appeal to the precariat. So we're in a, in, a, in a really interesting political time as well as an economic crisis. I, I think you're right. The problem is that the old le the what is called the left is fighting uh, against industrial capitalism, when yep. uh, which has already been superseded by what we all agree is rentier capitalism. And uh, in agree. order to uh, have them uh, act in their class interests against the rentier capitalism, they have to understand what a rentier is and what rentier capitalism is. Now, David did a huge, uh, more than anyone else, I think, in uh, the Occupy Wall Street by spreading this consciousness of the 1% versus the 99%, the 1% being the rentiers. And what happened? The police broke them up everywhere. Uh, uh, the police came at midnight, smashed them up. It was broken up by violence. Uh, mm -hmm. And as, as you pointed out, Guy, uh, the one thing that the rentier capitalism wants to prevent is any consciousness that there is an alternative. That's the mm -hmm. Margaret Thatcher. There is no alternative. And you make sure there's no alternative by not letting people like you or me or David have a, a, a large uh, public platform uh, in the media uh, and uh, have any way of getting our worldview to the people who have an interest in uh, understanding our worldview. Absolutely. And any time a, a, some kind of alternative... I mean, we used to talk in the 80s about the threat of a good example. Anytime, anywhere, people are experimenting with alternative uh, ways of going about things, um, it's not so much that they need to be destroyed as they need to suffer. Uh, it seems to be, you know, it's okay. You could have your own little independent corner of Syria, but as long as you're utterly miserable, you know, and starving, and, you know, we'll, we will make, in no case can alternative policies actually improve people's lives because. The moment everybody knows that happens, the game's over. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a, a question that I have. I mean, it's interesting. We're, we're talking about the problem with the left reaching out. And to some degree, it's just a matter of suppressing alternative perspectives. Uh, alternative media such as this and so has done a fairly good job at that. If you look at America and you see that you know, most young people say, prefer socialism to capitalism, despite the fact that you know, find anybody ever saying something non conservative about socialism in the mainstream U.S. media ever. You know, you can't. Um, so, so clearly they're getting that from somewhere. It's clearly from alternative media, from social movements. Uh, but it strikes me that, that there are deeper problems, perhaps, in the emerging class uh, picture 
which makes it difficult to fight Ronche capitalism and might help explain why right-wing populists have been doing a better job uh, than we have, uh, for example, Jonathan Burke Corbyn, at seizing those resentments that come from current arrangements. Uh, and, I, and, and I'm curious what you guys think about uh, it struck me that the problem the left has is that one of the major forms of class antagonism is between, uh, under a, a regime of rentier capitalism, is between people essentially engaged in a form of caregiving, uh, whether they're, you know, in the medical professions, education, social care, um, very, working on improving other people's lives directly or maintaining growing, uh, taking care of things, animals, people. Okay, so there's care. The working cl a class is essentially turning more and more into a caring class. As manufacturing jobs decline, caring jobs go up. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that productivity, it goes way up when you digitize production, but it actually goes down when you digitize like uh, education, health, and other caring professions. And I've actually found um, statistics on this from the Federal Reserve. Uh, it's quite clear the productivity is going down. They don't say why, um, but it's pretty easy to say. You know, uh, if you have qualitative outcomes and you have to turn it into a language a computer can understand, a guy's got to sit there and fill out forms all day just to feed it into the machine. And I know from my own experience that's, that is in fact what they'd really like me to be doing all day: um, is filling out forms so as to be able to like compare learning outcomes or whatnot. Okay, so, so, so you also have. Those are the guys in rebellion. If you look around the world, it's teachers, it's um, even professors, it's nurses, junior doctors, care home workers, ambulance drivers. Those are the people on strike uh, everywhere in the world. Um, so it's almost as if there is a rebellion of the caring classes. However, who is the immediate enemy of those guys? The, um, uh, it's the administrators. And there was a, a strike in New Zealand where it was really, they laid it out on the table. They said, you know, we're striking babies, we haven't got a raise in 10 years because anytime you get more money, you just hire more paper pushers. Paper pushers don't have anything to do, so they make up paperwork for us to do. So we have to spend 60% of our time filling out forms. We can't take care of our patients. So not only are, are, are you not giving us, um, you know, have you not given us a raise, you can actually make it increasingly difficult for us to make our job with the money uh, that you're taking from us. Um, and I think that's a paradigm for what's happening across the economy. So, so their immediate enemies are, are these sort of professional managerial classes, the people with the bulk of jobs, um, who are actually making it harder for them to take care of other people. However, the problem with the left is that it's trying to represent both these guys at the same time. You know, so, so it's trying to represent them, you know, in America, the, the teachers and the school administrators are in the same union. Yeah, uh, they're definitely in the, by the same party, and it's the professional managerials who are the real base of that party. Who, as as Guy points out, you know, insofar as they're the part of the salariat, are actually caught up in rentier capitalism themselves and constantly being encouraged to look at the world from that point of view. Did Michael just disappear? Uh, no. Okay. Um, and um, okay. Um, so, so let me let me just compliment that point, uh, David. If I, may. Um, I think it's very important to see that within occupational families or occupational groups, mm -hmm. the class structure is actually reproduced inside mm -hmm. those occupations. So for example, if you look at management, you have an elite that is rentier in large part, you have a salariat part of managers, and you increasingly have a precariat part of managers. Hmm. You know, uh, George Clooney's famous film, uh, Up in the Air, I don't know if you've seen it, but oh. Up in the Air is about a precariat manager. He's literally employed on a day contracts, day contracts to go around in firms, take difficult management decisions, stay a couple of weeks, and then he's out. And he's on short-term contract. But he's a manager, you see. Yeah. And actually, there's been a huge growth in the precariat managers. Mm. Who are who, some of whom are earning a lot, some are earning 20 pounds a day or something. And it's so that within that group, you have a, a class structure. Same with the medical professions, the nursing profession, the teaching professions, or journalism. Mm, you have journalism an one too, yeah. Salarian, and you have a precariat in every one. And the rent, rental incomes are being taken by the upper echelons within the occupations. It's a it's a form of rentier capitalism. 
it's been accentuated by the shift to occupational licensing away from mm -hmm. old guild traditions that existed mm -hmm. hundreds of years. Because the licensing processes enables the rentiers to take a larger part of the total income. And, and, and it's an important part of understanding the precariat and where the tensions lie. Because for some parts of the precariat, the biggest enemy is the upper echelons of their own occupation. And that is uh, something that is very uh, strange about uh, rentier capitalism. Yeah, that's why I refer to managerial feudalism. You have these ranks and ranks of retainers, and you know they're all sort of taught to identify mm -hmm. with the people on the top. But as you go down, they uh, increasingly have, are the the debtors rather than the creditors. Yeah. And and you get those kind of rent. One of the fascinating things about uh, managerial financial capital is the creation of these endless gradations. Like you you mentioned journalism. Yeah, suddenly there are producers and journalism in, on top of editors. They're always adding new hierarchical ranks. In in Hollywood, it's gotten so that there's like five or six ranks of uh, producers and executive producers. Used to be there were three or four people. You know, there's a writer, there's a director, there's the producer, executive producer provides the money. And now there's like you know executive vice president for creative development and you know there's all and, and I asked some people who write for movies like why do movies suck nowadays um because everybody in the industry agrees that they've gone downhill he says well that's it every single one of those guys feel they have to justify their existence so they all fiddle with the script and you know um so you end up with a script that's written by 27 people um you know with no consistent voice or idea and anything that's like at all interesting and challenging they, they somebody decides to cut it out so everything becomes a mishmash um so that, that kind of feudalistic arrangement um becomes a big political liability and one thing that I, i've been thinking is one reason people like trump or like johnson Johnson is famous for pretending to be this completely disorganized, shambolic guy, when in fact he's not. You know, but there was a famous uh, line about him by a friend who watched him do this interview where he just seemed totally confused and chaotic, and then like saw him do another interview a year later where he did exactly the same lines in exactly the same order. You know, it's a pure performance of, uh, of uh, and and. Why is he doing that? Well, I realize that these guys, what they're basically doing is they're playing the exact polar opposite of the annoying professional managerial class manager who makes your life a living hell by making you go to motivational me uh, meetings and fill out time allocation studies. He's pretending to be the opposite of that guy. I'm all about content, I'm all about getting things done, but I'm like, personally chaotic and disorganized and paperwork seems like totally alien to me. Um, yeah, so there yeah, is- I, 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 If I may intervene on that one, David. Yeah. I happen to have the dubious pleasure of spending most of a day uh, locked in a room with Boris Johnson last March. Oh, yes. A long series of arguments with him. And what the thought that came through is that he does genuinely represent the plutocracy and the financial elite uh, mixed with the landed interests as well. He's, you know, his class, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But but he's a systematic uh, liar. He <laughs> liar. He just cannot. I, I never had a discussion with someone who told more lies in in the a limited amount of time. Yeah. That there is no such thing as truth for these people. He's just like his friend in the White House. Mm. In they, they manufacture out of thin air a a fabricated uh, story. Like his famous, you know, save three hundred and fifty million a week from the well, for the NHS thing. He, he denied ever saying that to me, uh, and then I should, on, on the side of a bus, yeah, <laughs> in this picture. <laughs> and the point is, of course, that they are they now control the knowledge commons. Mm -hmm. Knowledge commons they have turned into a plutocratic instrument of disinformation. I don't think Trump is going to get away with it because he's he's such an ass and the way he's handled COVID-19. But the danger is that they can manipulate and they're using rentier mechanisms mm -hmm. to do that. It's part of, and it stems from Goldman Sachsism. And Mike will, be, will, will back me up on this. If you look at it, I've got a whole section in my book on the corruption of capitalism, looking at the extraordinary number of ex-Goldman Sachs alumni who've gone into senior positions of government and international banking and governance. 
including Drachy, including Mark Carney. They're all ex-Goldman Sachs. And now Britain has a young, inexperienced Chancellor of the Exchequer who made his millions as a head manager for Goldman Sachs and represents financial capital. Mm -hmm. So you'll see more and more in measures that try to restore the rentier system. I don't think it will work. But if you, you can look at the wage subsidy schemes that they've introduced, they are re rewarding the salariat and the elite, giving them vast uh, subsidies, whereas the precariat is being screwed. Mm. They're not really getting any money at all out of these measures. So you're going to see a vast increase of rentierism and a vast increase of inequalities through the measures that they're doing at the moment. And, and to go back to Julio's earlier point, that, that what is the pandemic going to do? I think they will try to repeat what they did in 2008 and flush the money into the financial markets and, and build up uh, the big tech, etc. But it's gone too far. And we don't see the sustainability. We're going to see millions become homeless, millions out in the streets. And this, the potential for social violence down the road, we're going to see it enormously. Now, whether it leads to supporting the Boris Johnsons and a better form of Trump, or a clever form of Trump, or, or we have a new left progressive agenda is, is an open subject, but I'm extremely pessimistic about the old social democrats and the old labor parties because they want to be respectable. So they mm. want to compromise with financial capitalism or rentier capitalism because they hope to get funds from them, they hope to get legitimacy, they hope to get the media on their side. It, they won't, it won't work, but that's what they're trying to do. You're right. Your uh, your point is that you're trying to get the precariat to understand the system, and uh, Boris right. Johnson and the others are saying are trying to just get them angry at the system. Mm, and then right. uh, the trick is to give the precariat money as long as the money is to pay the precariat's debts to the banks, mm. so they don't default on the loans to the banks. Give the precariat right now. They're going to give the precariat money to pay the landlords. They're not giving the the precariat money. They're not giving precariat money, Mario. That's the problem because now we're going to see that they they uh, they've denied wanting to give the precariat money. You know. The, the, for example, the British government and other governments have said, we will not go down to giving basic income. In the U.S., they want to give the money to pay to the extent that it's to pay the banks. Just like uh, right. the, the U.S. That's Treasury right. gives money to Argentina so that it can pay the foreign debt to Chase right. Manhattan that's and right. the other banks. As long well, as they're paying the money to that. themselves, it's okay. They this can is pay bit. money to somebody else that isn't to them, doesn't end up in their own pockets. This is a little better than 2008 when Obama, given the cho when he was actually, oh, George Bush was a lame duck and agreed to a bailout of, of mortgage holders in so as a way of bailing out the banks, Obama actually said, no, we don't want people to understand that they can get bailouts to bail out the banks directly, but like, you know, don't, don't help the mortgage holders. Um, so at least it's a little bit of progress. This time around, they are going to bail out the banks through the mortgage holders. Or do they they're also giving mortgage holidays, David. I mean, you know, allowing people to not have to pay their mortgages, which is a very, very cost-based policy. But here it's only a delay in the pay. For three months, you don't have to. And in three months, it all falls through. You will not have had an income. And that's when the hammer is going to fall. It's going to fall in August and September when all the past rent comes due, all the credit card money, all the bank money comes due, and people don't, haven't had an income to pay. And uh, that's when you're going to have the break in the chain of payments. I agree. Ma Michael, Michael, just coming in on this point, do you think this is the end of the dollar hegemony or does the economic crisis of the world mean a stronger dollar in this context? So the question is what... Uh, what are we going to do? Uh, if we needed a program, uh, a lot a lot of us have talked about debt cancellation. And the good thing about canceling the debts is you cancel the savings. It, you, we cannot make progress until we wipe out the savings of the 1% that is all this fund that is used to fight against everything that we're standing up for. That is a debt jubilee. Could you explain what that is a bit more for the audience? A debt jubilee. Oh, has it gone dead? A debt jubilee? Can you hear me? I can hear you. 
Okay. What is a debt jubilee, Michael? Can you go a bit further into this point? Could somebody repeat my question to Michael, please? He's, they're asking you, can you t explain what a debt jubilee would be, Michael? Well, a, a debt jubilee be, should be a wiping out of the debt, of saying uh, it, it'll be like in 1931 when uh, the inter-allied debts and the German uh, reparations were wiped out. Or it could be the uh, German monetary reform of uh, 1948. They said, well, most of the debts are owed to the ex-Nazis. And uh, so we're going to wipe out all the debts because we don't have the Nazis, we, the Nazi people uh, and banks and companies to have the money to gain control of the economy. So we're going to wipe out all of the debts except for the debts that employers own their employees and uh, everybody has a minimum uh, bank account. And that was a German economic miracle. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the Jubilee would be a, uh, uh, a, a debt forgiveness. You, you don't want to wipe out the uh, real estate uh, debts because otherwise, if real today, if real estate's bought uh, with hardly any equity, uh, and the landlords all pay the rent, rent is for paying interest, then you'd add, you'd create a new landlord class. So you don't want to create a new landlord class. Uh, a, a debt cancellation would have to go hand in hand with uh, taking uh, land and natural resources back into the public domain. Otherwise, you'd just be creating a huge, uh, uh, the absentee owners that have bought companies and buildings uh, on, uh, uh, on debt uh, would end up uh, richer than everybody else. So you, you have to wipe out the savings along with the debts. And uh, be, uh, that's the basic balance sheet relations. And if you have, uh, most debts are owed by the 99% to the 1%, uh, if you wipe out the 99% debt, you don't want to leave the 1% savings in place. You don't want to leave them whole and uh, just uh, free the debtors uh, and have the government uh, somehow uh, uh, subsidize the 1%. You have to wipe out both sides of the balance sheet because it's all an overgrowth of uh, savings and uh, debt together. May I, may I make a point here? I think I, I, my own view is that the 1%, 99% uh, imagery is very useful at the time of the Occupy movement. Actually, uh, Stymie's analysis of rentier capitalism. Hmm. The figure I'm about to show is fairly familiar to, to both of you, I'm sure, but maybe not to all our listeners. But it, it, it's, it's a picture here of the global decline in the proportion of national income going to all those performing labor. Mm, mm. The decline has been enormous across the world, in, in every part of the world, most of all in China, as well as the United States and Europe and Japan. And it means that, uh, that most of the income is going to not the 1%, but the top 30, 40%. And mm. this it's the rentiers are, include a large part of the salariat. In Germany, <coughs> excuse me, in Germany, for example, uh, the salariat is getting 40% of its uh, income from various forms of assets. 40%. So when it comes to whether you want to push for higher wages or, or higher profits, those people actually are torn. Which way would they support? And they tend to support the rising thing, so they go for higher profits and higher share prices and not for higher wages. So it's the, the, the class dynamics are not uh, just 1%, 99%. If it was that simple, it would be easier. We yeah. Easier political challenge. But I, but I think the, the interesting thing is we've got to dismantle the debt mechanisms. And, and a friend of mine, Jeff Crocker, has, has got a very good graph which showing that wages have gone hardly up at all and consumption has gone up steadily. And what it represents is that because there is pressure on living standards of those people relying on wages to maintain their old living standards, they've gone further and further into debt. And if you had a debt jubilee or a write-off of debt, which would have to include the precariat having all their debts wiped out, otherwise they'll still be out. Well, of course, they're the major targets, yeah. 
Yeah. Exactly. But if you did that without altering the debt mechanisms that exist, it, it will be back. It will be very quickly back. The same problems, maybe. Mm. But but so we would still have a a crisis of rentier capitalism very quickly. I think we're going to have it, and uh, in a sense, bring it on. Mm. But but the progressive forces must have a strategy for dealing with it. And at the moment, we don't. I mean, if you look at Piketty's work, when you get down to it, what's he suggesting? It's a sort of democratic, uh, bit of twisting and little bits right. of, it's not altering the structures. Yeah, I, I once said of Piketty. Yeah. But there, there, there was a, resp uh, a strategy uh, along just these lines in the 1930s when uh, uh, you had the Chicago School, uh, amazingly enough, called the Chicago Plan. Uh, yeah, the, the Chicago Plan uh, of 100% reserves. They said the whole problem is uh, the commercial banks creating credit. And what do commercial banks create credit for? To buy, to transfer property, not to uh, uh, fund uh, creation of new means of production, but to buy real estate. Uh, and uh, corporate raids. So uh, you want to get rid of the Federal Reserve and the commercial banks, and you want the government, you want credit to be a public utility. And if credit's a public utility, then it's extended for public purposes, not for the purposes that the commercial uh, banking system uh, uh, extends it for. So you'd have public banking, uh, with, and uh, uh, the banks would act more or less like savings banks. They couldn't create the credit, uh, because when they create the credit, it's to create the very superstructure that you're quite rightly criticizing. If I might, might intervene here, though, I, the problem would be the democratic control over that credit system, because in a way, you know, what China and India have done is something almost like that. I remember, uh, some, yeah. yeah, you know, they've created like incredible cheap credit, uh, and it's uh, talk, talked about as irresponsible financial sector making bad loans, crony capitalism, inside deals. But, you know, if this is a corrupt system, it's also the only system I've ever seen anybody invent that will take a formerly third world country and turn it into a first world country. So how bad can it be? On the other hand, you have to slam on the brakes at some point um, because then it be simply becomes a power structure, which is what we've seen. And you have a kind of mafiosi controlling things and, and just continuing to do these massive mafia-style mafia construction projects without um, any need for them uh, at destroying the planet as they do so. so. So without some form of democratic control over that mechanism, it'll just go crazy and, and destroy us all. Right. The question is, how do you do that? Well, I, 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 following up Michael's points, I think one of the most urgent needs on, on the left is to have a strategy for democratizing monetary policy. And one of the worst things that uh, labor and social democratic governments have done over the last uh, is to allow uh, their central banks to have independence from political control. I thought that one of the worst things that Gordon Brown did when he became chancellor in 97 was to declare the Bank of England independent of political control. Well, immediately mm -hmm. they start a deflationary policy, a policy that is entirely geared to giving a basic income to the financiers, if you like, because they will guarantee to step in to keep keep the financial markets uh, liquid and, and buoyed. And it's very interesting that in the last couple of weeks, well, the economy, the real economies have been crashing and unemployment has been shooting up everywhere. The stock markets have been booming and mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. entirely consistent with what happened after 2008. Uh, but I don't think they'll get away with it this time because A, the number of people have learnt they can't be told the, the lies that it was public debt that needed to be reduced. Uh, and B, that the, cri the real economy crisis, because of those eight giants, has become much greater now than it was in 2008. So uh, it, it, it is a time where you feel that you, we want to give the backbones of politicians on the left some, some strength, because at the moment they're showing familiar spaghetti spines. Oh, and yeah, they're totally collapsing, yeah, everywhere. They're not showing the guts to say, Look, this is a time for change. 
and they use the beverage uh, motto of his 1942 report, this is a time for revolutions, not patching. That's mm. He was a plain old fashioned liberal. So, so I think this is really a, a, a crisis point and the fundamental need is the dismantling of rent. And, and for that, we need, we need the analytical tools, we need the imagination, and we need a, a new vocabulary in many respects. Well, I think we, um, we've all been trying to work on that. I mean, exactly. what, I, what, I see, what, what I see before me is both with Sanders and with Corbyn was a explicit attempt to rally um, the precariat, essentially, uh, to rally young people in precarious situations. And they were the foot soldiers. They were the guys who were driving those movements. We can't say they were you know, overwhelmingly sitting it out, uh, but an inability to, to expand, you know, to make that class, as Marx says, to make that class as problems, as sort of uh, epitome in everyone's minds of the problems of the system as a whole. I mean, that's that that's how you put together a winning coalition. Now, a question of why were they not able to do that so that both the Democratic Party and the Labour Party um, are, are pivoting back to that neoliberal center, are basically falling back on finance capital and an alliance with it to, you know, shield them from the hordes being unleashed by the extractive and destructive sector, the more reactionary elements of capitalism. Uh, why did that not work? And, and I, I, was an economic, I was an economic advisor to John McDonnell, who was I, there. I was too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Chancellor. He was basically the deputy leader in, in all but name. Yeah. And I, I saw it from the inside. There were the, the, John understands the precariat. He understands it and had a very Marxist interpretation. Mm -hmm. He understood basic income and so on, and he supports that. Jeremy Corbyn didn't really understand uh, the, the, the new classes and the, the dynamic the economics of it. He represented the sort of link with old laborism. And mm. he had around him old Communist Party, uh, advisors, you know, with with definite uh, uh, strains of bring back the old, the old mm. socialism, which was was never going to appeal to many of the elements of the precariat, or let alone the salariat. But of course, they were drowned by Brexit. Brexit became a one issue, so it became a khaki election. You were either for or against Brexit. And, uh, and the, the rest is history. So I think it's difficult to interpret, but but the I kept saying to John, you must have a narrative for the precariat. And he had great difficulty because a lot of the old labor peas and laborist people, including the TUC, the trade unions, wanted to go back to jobs, 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 full employment. I know, I know, I know. I mean, I, I talked to John too about this, and I pointed out that you know, uh, acting the whole idea of the balanced budget or the budget fiscal responsibility that he con was constantly um, trying to reassure people about said, you know, you, you don't actually believe this stuff, do you? Uh, I mean, you know how money creation actually works. He said, no, I know, I know it's not real, but it's your job to create the situation where I can go on TV and not have to be asked that question. Um, uh, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the subject. Everybody. <laughs> I would, I would uh, maybe Julio. do a quick round and remember that I has to leave very soon. What's up? I'm sorry, my connection is imperfect. Yeah. Um, I need to leave soon, so we're going to have to wrap up the conversation at least for the, in terms of the video. Um, oh, that's too bad. Yeah. We're having but fun. I think you, you know, feel free to continue if you want to. Well, okay. Um, I mean, we're getting towards solutions. Um, I guess the you know, for me, just as to continue the, the stream we're on, Brexit worked. You know, as they say. Boris Johnson played the sort of anti-bureaucrat, and Brexit was an issue which focused people's hostility towards the professional managerial class as a whole. And um, you know the, the the people in the Labour Party who did represent that professional ministry of the as you put it, 
um, you know, played along with basically forcing Corbyn into sort of defending the existing institutional order against the insurgents. Um, so he seemed like he represented the, you know, the lawyers and the, um, and the hatred of the EU is meant to evoke. So, so that worked. Um, oh, he had to say that. What, what's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Are, are, uh, what's going on? Michael. No, sorry. I, I, I ah, headphones. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to say that at least in the UK, I observed what happened, that the right managed to maneuver the left, you know, take advantage of that disjuncture between you know, the attempt to represent the carrying class, as I call it, the carrier, and the um, professional managerials at the same time. Uh, they maneuvered Corbyn into the situation through Brexit, where it seemed like they were the ones against the managers, uh, the bureaucrats, and Corbyn sort of represented, was willing to go against the popular will in order to um, defend basically the status quo, the institutional structure as an end in itself, proceduralism as an end in itself, the whole drama in Parliament basically sank it. He is in the eyes of, of of pro of uh, pro league voters, it just showed that like you know that professional managerial classes believe in rules and regulations much more than they believe in popular will. They don't really trust the people, and he's one of them. So so that worked. I'm not sure how th what happened in America, um, but the question is how do we overcome that? How do we how do we become the insurgents in the eye in the eyes of the people who are being most screwed over? Um, and maybe we have to leave the domain of parliamentary politics entirely at this point in order to be able to do that and come back later. I mean, I'm an anarchist, and that's what I'm inclined to say that. Uh, but I'd be, <laughs> um, but I'd be interested in what other ideas people have about how the political work of making the woes of the zero contract um, worker into a representation of the problems of society itself. I may I come in, David? Hello? Yeah, yeah, please do. Um, I, I, think, I think this is a, a moment where we have to both look back and look forward in the sense that there are certain things that always accompany a transformation. And one boring sounding transformation that takes place is that each time we have a huge global crisis in capitalism, a new set of statistics, a new way of representing reality uh, comes into prominence. We had that definitely in the 1930s when the labor force approach crystallized in the way uh, we looked at the labor markets. Before the 1930s, you couldn't measure the unemployment rate because it was on an occupational basis that stemmed from the 19th century. Today, I think what we're going to see is a dismantling of any st statistical respect for GDP, mm. any, dis any respect for focusing on labor. And we're going to see, the realize that we are already seeing that appreciation of work that is not labor is mm. this pandemic we the, as it happens the office for national statistics two years ago did an estimate of the value of unpaid work care work maybe, mm. maybe. and they came up with an estimate of 1.24 trillion pounds per year and the, by contrast, the value created by all manufacturing and all non-financial services came to just over one trillion. In other words, the value, mm. the imputed value wow. of unpaid work is greater than the value of labor. That's amazing. Right? It was 49% 10 years ago. Yeah, so it's gone up. Statistics, but it's also found, you find it in France, you find it in Switzerland, you find it in the United States, and there are various estimates. I think that people will not accept the old way of valuing. 
and that we will want to have statistics on how much people how much time people are spending for the precariat they have to spend a huge amount of time working for the state unpaid mm. try and get universal credit you have to do a hell of a lot a hell of a lot of work they don't do any labor but they they're forced to do a lot of work uh, for which they're not paid and it's the same with the precariat in all pro all professions when i talk about it to a journalist for example they'll end up giving me a lecture about how much work they'd have to do without being paid for any of it <laughs> so i think we're going to see a statistical revolution mm. now it sounds boring to uh, to somebody who's interested in politics but it will determine how people look at reality the statistics turn determine political rhetoric, political imagery. Once you could measure unemployment rate, it became the indicator mm. that was used by everybody. Oh, the unemployment rate's 3.2. It mm. doesn't actually mean anything. It's a completely fictitious statistic, but it dominates newspapers and politics. And right. I think I, the revolution I in the 1960s in the same way. Before that, there was no growth of GDP. Nobody ever had that concept. Really? Absolutely. <laughs> Michael too has been working on the changing indicators or, or, or uh, to discount the yes, sort of imaginary finance. Tell, tell us about that. Well, I think that every year when the government comes out with the statistics, we should have a chart book, maybe about a hundred uh, charts with a discussion on the opposite page with our statistics. And what I found that all the growth in GDP since 2008 has been uh, imputed rent seeking. It's been the increased rental value of uh, owner occupied houses and it's been financial earnings. May, what the financial sector earns above the uh, uh, Federal Reserve's discount rate. None of this has been production. It's not really uh, a product and income. It uh, mm -hmm. has nothing to do. And the all I've looked at the British uh, figures for rent as a proportion of income for every group and the Federal Reserve. These statistics are faked. There, there's been no change whatsoever in 30 years. Every group today is paying exactly the same uh, rent uh, to income ratio as it was 30 years ago. There's never a squiggle, never an upside down. They're all imputed. They're told, here's, here's the, here is the assumption uh, that we will use for the proportions. And uh, we, can, we can do these statistics and we can put our own. The capital gains, in, capital gains each year are much bigger than the entire growth of the GDP. So hmm. we want to say, how do people get wealthy? They get it through capital gains. Uh, the old left talks about profit. Uh, only the poor people make profit. Uh, the the uh, You have to pay taxes on profit. Rich people make capital gains because you don't have to pay taxes on them. So you you uh, make everything in the form of capital gains. So I think the three of us could, could write a... Uh, uh, a chart book every year with the charts and the commentary illustrating uh, our ideas and uh, the government will come out with its statistics and we'll say here's the real world economy. I think that's an incredibly important thing to do. I mean I was just thinking about this the other day when I saw the statistics about the shrinkage of the economy because of the virus and they were saying oh this is a disaster we've never seen anything like this in terms of GDP. Uh, my god it might go down by a third you know the size of the economy. It's like, wait, everybody's locked in their house doing nothing and the economy only yep. comes by a third? What are they measuring here? It's not actually economic activity, clearly. Right. <laughs> May I say, I think we've finished, have we not? Oh, I hope not. No, it's still recording. <laughs> yeah, I think Gaia, Gaia has to leave at five, but if you if you want, you can do maybe another, another round of... People are winding up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think a final, a final round of... Uh you know, closing remarks. Okay, well, it sounds like we've got a project. We are gonna change the economic indicators. We're going to form a group. We can call it Spectre. Um, <laughs> and, uh, we won't tell people what that stands for. Uh, and we will issue our alternative indicator report annually. Uh, what do you think? How do you feel about that, Christoph? Well, um, I, I was, I was arguing this with John McDonald last year. We can get him to and, <laughs> and I, no, I, I was urging that we produce a report on how to reform uh, labor statistics and, and have a new paradigm uh, focusing on occupations, focusing on work, et cetera. 
And it was a project that we were, get, we were going to do. And had Labour won, uh, we, I was anticipating that, that some significant activity was going to take place. I, I, I think that it's, it's a worthy thing to be doing. I don't know about a single report each time. Uh, that, that's, that's, uh, that sounds fun, but I suspect it would uh, drag us in funny directions. I, 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 I think that there is something in that, but the, I'd like to end on, a, on another subject, if I may, which is that um, I've been writing about the plunder of the commons. And I think it's, the, it's one of the less told aspects of rentier capitalism, which is that why I wrote the book on the plunder of the commons, because the commons are traditionally ways of lessening inequalities, providing informal social protection, and they've always been the, the, the radical part of society, going back to the Charter of the Forest of 1217, when the idea of a right of subsistence in the commons was enshrined in the unwritten British constitution and it's been integrated e everywhere else. And I think one of the uh, lesser told stories of the austerity era, not just in Britain, not just in the United States, but, but everywhere, has been the erosion of the commons and the conversion of the commons into rent, rentier capitalist systems. It starts with nature, the enclosure, of the sea, something that's hardly been uh, appreciated. We've had an, an incredible enclosure of the sea, which represents the biggest enclosure in history. And yet, yet it hasn't been incorporated into the analysis of global capitalism. So when you create uh, e exclusive economic zones of 200 nautical miles from the coast, you basically convert it into the first stage of privatization and commodification and the development of patents. Mm. And you have a situation where one company has 47% of all the patents in the oceans. It's a story that is phenomenal because it's, it's really the ultimate uh, extraction of rent. Okay. So the commons goes to the, from the sea to the land to the for the to forests that have been privatized, including in Britain and, and the monuments in the United States and the Polish forests and so on. And then you have the social commons, which have been privatized and commodified and turned into rent seeking assets. The civil commons and the cultural commons and the intellectual commons that, that goes into mm -hmm. knowledge and so on. So for me, the, 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 you cannot really understand rental capitalism without seeing what has happened to our commons. And I, I think that is a story which we haven't discussed in our, our discussion very much, but I think it is a really important part of the overall narrative. And we need a strategy for reviving the commons. Mm. That's Gee, Guy, I bet I, you could get a great contract from Goldman Sachs telling them what parts <laughs> of the commons are still open. As a matter of fact, I yeah, think they right. have memos not working much, on exactly not much. this topic. They, well, they, they make a comment. No, they, I, they're I, looking I, at, uh, almost all the wealth in history, you could say, has been an through the appropriation of the commons. It's all right. privatization. And this, right. this is what privatization is. And this is what these companies are looking at. What can we privatize like water and charge for water? Air. If you, if you, if you know, go back, what can they do? Global, this is exactly what uh, their strategy is. If you go back to the global justice movement, you'll find that one of the analysis that we took very much to heart was that of the Midnight Notes Collective and other people coming out of the post workerist tradition, where they basically made the argument, first of all, that you know what Marx called primitive accumulation is still going on. As you're pointing out, they're still constantly finding a new commons to privatize, but then it works both ways. The political struggle is fighting, you know, each side is trying to privatize and grab certain commons, but also trying to keep other things in common in their own interest. So capitalism, like capitalism, like certain commons, they call them externality. You know, they want to have free education so as they can train workers. They don't want to have to train the workers themselves. They want to have roads for themselves. Um, so, so it's actually a battle over what is common and what isn't. What they want is enough, you know, commons which provide them with free resources 
and free work, uh, workers already trained in and to be exploited in the ways that they need, but they don't, you know, they want to grab everything else and they don't want those workers to have any means to sustain themselves independently of the capitalists. So, so both sides are trying to keep some things in common and to grab other ones. Uh, or, or, yeah, and that's what political struggle is largely consists of. And the Charter of the Forest is a great example because as pe people like uh, Weinbaum pointed out, um, you know, I mean, that was a major source of fuel. So keeping the forest as a common resource was the equivalent of nationalizing petroleum in, 12, uh, in 1217. Um, these, that was a very radical gesture. Um, so, so it's a nice way to conceive of it. What do they want in common for their convenience? And they want to grab the rest and claim a title to it completely artificially. And what do we want to keep in common? And on that note, mm -hmm. reforestation and so on, I'm going to um, stop the recording at this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good to see you, David. Yeah, it was Good to see Mike. Too. We must we must continue this conversation. I actually think I, I think we should do something together in terms of like thinking about other indicators because you know I think that's really theologically important. For me, the moment when neoliberalism really started to insinuate itself retrospectively into people's minds was I remember this in the 80s when I was watching cable TV, it was a new thing. And they had a soft quote crawl go going underneath the bottom of, of the screen. And they never used to have that in the news before. And suddenly it's like, we're all supposed to look at the world from the point of view of an investor. Almost nobody watching that show has stocks and almost nobody like who did have stocks to be, oh, look what happened to my shares and that. I mean, it was completely, uh, it was a complete symbolic gesture telling us, you know, we all have to look at the world from the perspective of Wall Street. It was right around that same time that like journalists got rid of their labor reporters. Remember when they used to have those? Uh, instead, we're all, we're all supposed to stop imagining ourselves as workers and start imagining ourselves as investors. 